Hello everyone, Dr. Shabazz here, and today I am going to present to you the first of many videos for this semester. We're going to start out with chapter one. Chapter one is titled Introduction to Global Marketing. And what we'll do here is set the stage for what is going to transpire over the next 13 or so weeks. And we're going to have somewhat of an overview of the principles of marketing, and then we'll flow into this idea of global marketing. Global marketing is also called multinational marketing, which is actually the title of this course. In some schools, it is called international marketing, inter meaning between, between two countries. Before I get into chapter one, I have uh, done a couple of different things. I have updated the syllabus. There were some changes that needed to be made to the syllabus. Most notably, we have a 10th edition of the book. So the 10th edition is the newest edition, uh, copyrighted in the year 2020. And we're going to move forward and adopt that textbook for this class. So. If you go to the canvas, I'm going to show you the post that I made. This is the post that I presented um, a couple of hours ago. This is Wednesday night. Uh, it's very quiet, so uh, sometimes it's best to do these videos uh, in the evening. Uh, but what I've done is uh, provided the ISBN number. So if you go online, you're able to locate it. This is not a Cengage text. So you may know that the campus is moving toward adopting Cengage as a publisher. That way, if you get a subscription to Cengage, you can get all of your textbooks. But this, this is not one of those Cengage textbooks. And perhaps in in the future, we will adopt a new textbook for this class. Uh, but for this semester, we have an, a new edition, 10th edition, by Keegan and Green. And it is the textbook that we have been using for the last uh, several semesters. I've been teaching this particular class for about the last three years. And prior to that, it was only taught at the graduate level. And I taught that class as well. So. This is the uh, textbook that we will use. Uh, I will also bring up the syllabus, which I went over last Thursday at our first day of class, but I want to bring your attention to some of the changes that I've made. Uh, There's some different um, information pertaining to the class. And of course, here I have the Zoom address. This will be the Zoom address that we'll use for the entire semester. So you won't have to worry about getting a different code for each class. Um, we have the Zoom link and below also have another Zoom link for the office hours. If you can't meet me during the office hours I have posted here, then you can always set up an appointment and we can meet uh, in that time that's convenient for you. Since I'll be on campus in two weeks, uh, where to report back on campus, then I will be in my office holding office hours, East Wing 422 in SBI. And my phone number is listed here, 599-8350. But the best way to reach me is via uh, email because I'm always on and then through Canvas, I always get notifications that I have a message and it is very easy to respond because I have my phone with me um, at all times. I do want to add that I have received a message about COVID testing. And we all have to get uh, COVID clearance prior to returning to campus within five days. So that's uh, one of the things that we have to focus on. We want to make sure that we have a safe environment. And I'm going to do everything that I can to see to it that uh, we don't have those types of risk. We are to provide proof of testing 
and you will be going to the student health center uh, to do that. There are two sites, testing sites, Bragg Stadium and another site on the FAMU campus, which is to be announced. And they also have for the undergraduates, January 11th through the 16th. So that started on uh, this morning and all the way through the end of the week. And they have each day uh, set aside for the different classifications. And then the faculty members, we will start next week doing our testing. And so they have um, a, uh, a four-step plan, and which ends with uh, the contact, contact tracing, which they will have a mobile app where we are to uh, keep our status updated so that they can ensure that there's, there's um, some type of data that's collected about the the uh, the rate of infections on the campus. So this is something that I that I got uh, via email and the schedule that is also included. So make sure that you take a look at that. You probably have already uh, started that process. So some of the the other information here I won't go through because I went through on Thursday, uh, but I will talk about some of the different things. Most notably, the 10th edition, as I had mentioned, we have a new textbook and I have the ISBN numbers there. Again, this is a Prentice Hall book. The information about the class is here. I have made also some updates. And here's a statement on COVID. So for those of you who have signed up for this class in person, I will be there and I will have my PPE on. I will have my mask, a shield or whatever else they give us. And I will have, I would imagine there's going to be some kind of plexiglass or there's going to be something that protects us. And I'm going to be on point. And so I would just ask those of you who have signed up to be in person, if we can honor this, these regulations, make sure we come in with the mask. If you find that you have to remove the mask, then make sure you leave the room, do what you have to do, and then put the mask back in its place. We also want to make sure that we social distance, and I have to, to make sure that I keep a distance from those who are sitting in the class. So that might necessitate you sitting back a row or so, so we can make sure that if I'm walking around the room that we keep that distance. So here they have the guidelines for how we're supposed to, how we're supposed to carry on our daily business. Uh, I still have not gotten answers to certain questions. As far as sanitation of the classrooms, that is forthcoming. So I will keep you updated on, on, those, um, on those directions. And everything else is the same as what I discussed on Thursday. And so if you have any questions, make sure that you bring them to class on Thursday. Uh, we will be in our Zoom uh, meeting on Thursday, and we will begin, as you can see here on the schedule, we will continue on with discussion of chapter one. Hopefully by that time you will have watched this video. There will be a quiz after this video, a 10 item quiz, which is essentially a review of principles of marketing, and then a few questions on chapter one. So. Make sure that you have um, purchased the text or you're in the process of purchasing, purchasing the text. Um, I typically will give some time for the class to get their affairs together and get their books. And so the quiz on, on 
um, Thursday or the, the quiz that you will take tomorrow will, will, will be more of a review of principles of marketing than it is going to be material in chapter one. But I, I'll have a couple of questions. Uh, I also have uploaded the slides as well. All right. So we're already 10 minutes in, in, in terms of me setting the stage for the class. And so I want to begin talking about chapter one. And hopefully we can uh, finish this within an hour and that will give you some time to complete the quiz. Um, I probably will have this available before your class begins. Um, I have not um, um, determined that because obviously I'm still shooting the video. So it, it's going to uh, really... Uh, be a factor of when I'm able to complete the editing of this video. But let's get started. So chapter one is introduction to global marketing. And this subject is very multifaceted. And it's, as I stated in the class and also on the post, this is a class that gets into marketing in a different level of analysis, meaning that everything in this class is global and everything in this class is marketing. And so also in marketing, you have to lay a foundation and give a historic, a historical context. And so what happens here is you have some different points where they go in history and they talk about how the international economy had evolved over a period of time and we all know that the international economy has evolved over centuries. And we're talking about the 15th century when the Spanish ships and the Portuguese ships set sail to find the new world. And they began these trading expeditions, uh, traveling to the Western Hemisphere, traveling to the uh, continent of Africa, the Spice Islands off the coast of Africa, India, the, the Indian uh, subcontinent, then Asia. Uh, and they had these um, expeditions where they would bring back all of these valuable goods from these different places. And, and so that was the forerunner of this economy that we now have. That set the foundation for the economy that we currently have. A lot of very important events occurred. We know in the 19th century that you had an uh, increase in this uh, trade activity. There were a number of theories. If you remember from previous classes, you may have heard of absolute advantage and comparative advantage, which these are th tr trade theories, which are, are really describing how countries make decisions in terms of what they specialize in and what they actually import. So you have these different models that were actually conceived over a period of time uh, in, the, in the 18th century and in the 19th century. Then you had uh, certain political events in the 20th century, two world wars, the first world war and the second world war very important in establishing the environment for trade. Now, in the um, first half of the of the 20th century, we had World War One, World, World War Two. After World War Two and and during World War Two, there were organizations that were created, most notably the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and you had the World Trade Organization that was founded in 1940. Um, well, actually, it was called the General Agreement on uh, Tariffs and Trade, which was founded in 1947. And then in 1995, it became the World Trade Organization. The United Nations was founded in 1945 after the end of the war. So you had all of these organizations that were created and that developed this platform of trade that we now have. So a, a number of things occurred after the war. The United States were, was the preeminent power 
because, of course, most of Europe was destroyed from the war. And this country was not only the foundation and the strongest power, but the currency, the U.S. dollar, was going to be the backbone of the system. And to this day, is still the backbone of the system. So when all of this occurred and when European nations rebounded and came back online, you had another burst of trade. And most notably, the Americans were importing more goods from Europe. And I might add going into tremendous debt as well. So marketing is... This is the AMA definition, the American Marketing Association definition. Uh, the activity set of institutions and processes for creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that have value for customers, clients, partners, and society at large. You may remember seeing that definition from principles of marketing, but there are some key words here. Processes, marketing is a process. That means that you have certain... Uh, activities that occur in order to make these marketing activities successful. And you have another key word here, exchanging. Well, what is a market? We know a market is an arena of buyers and sellers, and those buyers and sellers engage in exchanges. The buyer gets goods that they want or services rendered, the seller gets compensation for the goods and services that they have sold. These goods and services offer value for that buyer. And then, of course, that seller has to ensure that they understand the customer and that that customer is satisfied. And if they're not satisfied, how they can make changes in order to uh, make that a product better or render that service in a more um, in, 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 in terms of the um, quality uh, making it more uh, um, making it more feasible for them to provide that quality service. So what is global marketing? If, if marketing is a set of activities and processes where exchanges are being um, are being fostered between buyers and sellers, then what is global marketing? Well, there's a difference in levels of analysis. As you can see in the matrix here, this is the product market growth matrix. You have uh, this matrix looks at the products that you have, whether they are existing products or new products whether you have existing markets or new markets. So when you penetrate in a country, let's say you have an export situation. You're exporting to another country. You have an existing product, but you're going to a new market. And you're going to a new market because you want to expand your horizons. Maybe your domestic market is saturated and you want to tap into a foreign market. It doesn't mean you have to go halfway around the world to engage in international business or, let's say, um, engage in activities with other countries. You can engage in trade with Canada, which is the northern neighbor, or Mexico, which is the southern neighbor. You can have partnerships in, in the, the Caribbean. Uh, or Latin America. These are places that, that are relatively close. And these existing markets may be ripe for uh, new products um, later on after you've established your, your, your presence. So the first, the first thing is that you have existing products going into existing markets. And you may already have business there, but you want to increase the level of your, uh, your presence in that country. You have situations where you have brand new products that you want to launch. 
into an existing market. You have new markets, totally new markets that you have not tapped before with products that you're trying to get rid of. This is one way if you have inventory as a company and you're trying to get rid of that inventory, you can look for new markets um, because of the product life cycle. Maybe your product is in the decline phase, but you're looking for markets that are in the growth phase. And you remember the product life cycle, which was introduction, growth, maturity, and decline. So if you're in the decline phase, you want to find a country that's in the introduction or growth phase. That way they will pay a premium for those products because they're rare and they have a, a demand for those products. And because of price elasticities, they won't have any substitutes. And so then they will have to pay a premium for, for that product. And then finally, you have new products, brand new products going into brand new markets. And sometimes companies have to create new products because the products they currently have, even with adaptation, simply will not work. And so you have to create an entirely new product for a new market. So this is the product market growth matrix. There are lots of different matrices and all of these frameworks in, in marketing and in global marketing, it, it is no different. So there are a number of different issues when you talk about marketing abroad. There are different rules. When you read the best frozen foods case, uh, in that case, you will see a lot of different rules uh, that, that were uh, located uh, or that were discovered in Germany. And I will just actually pull this best frozen foods case over so we can get a look at it. And we're, we're going to discuss this on Thursday. And this is obviously a fictitious case, as you can tell by the names. F. Rosen or Frozen, president of Best Frozen Foods Company, is seeking to go into a new market. He's seeking to go into Germany because he understands that there's a market for, fre for fresh, for frozen foods at the commissaries, which is the, the stores on the military basis. And he wants to expand out in Germany. So he is putting NEW market or new market on the case and NEW market comes back and he finds all of these different issues. And you will note the different issues that is constraining for these products going into Germany. I believe they even said West Germany. So this is a very old case because West Germany uh, ceased to exist in 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell, uh, which is, it's very important to have a, a, a grip on history because as a business person going overseas, you wanna know the environment that you're going into and you want to know the climate and you know you want to know the sensitivities of the places uh, that you're going because it, it just makes a difference in terms of your insight in terms of the expectations that um, you may have go going in there are other issues such as counterfeiting piracy in china in other places not just china we like to pick at China because, yes, piracy is, is rampant in China. Uh, but in another num number of other places, you can also find that piracy is uh, widespread. Uh, I have a video that I like to show in my classes, and it's called the 10 Worst uh, Knockoffs. And uh, it shows different categories of products that have been copied from toys to soft drinks to uh, athletic apparel to cell phones to candy, all of these things have been targeted. Not to mention uh, when we talk about uh, fast foods, those are also pirated. So you have a lot of issues when you go abroad and, and you have to, to ensure 
that you have a country that, that has uh, will offer you protection so that uh, your products are not uh, stolen because essentially that's um, uh, what happens. So it says here, it's a quote from John Quelch. I remember reading him as a doctoral student, Jathrin uh, Jos. Uh, they state that the best global brands are also the best brands, which is essentially saying that before you establish a global brand, you should establish a foundation at home first before uh, embarking abroad. I wanna show you a couple of articles and these, these articles are articles where companies have decided that they're going to expand overseas. And this first uh, article deals with uh, Nestle's. And Nestle's, uh, as you know, uh, produces a, lots of different consumer products. And... Here you have these merchants, and, and this is in the outskirts of Brazil. And many times when you're in the outskirts, you don't have the ability to move around. The mobility is limited. You don't have access to certain resources. And so here they have hired these uh, merchants to sell products to the people in the remote areas uh, with this uh, buggy, which looks like a buggy, and that is a, a, a convenience. That is a convenience for the, the people in that area. But the criticism is that most of what they're selling is processed foods, and they link that to obesity. And so as a company, uh, you have to also be a good corporate citizen which means you have corporate social responsibility. And so you don't want to make it appear that you are contributing to a health problem there in terms of obesity. Very interesting article. And again, in Brazil, where they're in the outskirts and people are just trying to make an honest living, to be honest. You have other cases when you talk about this idea of multinational marketing, you have, as we again talk about the obesity issue and fast foods, we see Kentucky Fried Chicken is being uh, highlighted here as a contributing factor to the, the increasing obesity rates in Ghana. And there's, um, uh, again, this is New York Times and they um, talk about the, the case uh, and the difference in uh, how their chicken is is prepared using palm oil. And, and then they also have other different types of side dishes. And you'll note that many countries, um, when they receive a franchise, there are adaptations that are made to the menu. And here you have Ghana. And they're going to show a, a picture below of the chicken being... Uh, dipped in the um, the palm oil, which is supposedly uh, a very saturated form of fat. So here you see the correlation between fast food sales and income. It's a very big business. When you go to South Africa, there's a Kentucky Fried Chicken seemingly on every uh, every square block. And there's a chicken, and you can see the orange tint that that would be palm oil. And so that is a case of Kentucky Fried Chicken. And lastly, you have McDonald's going into India. Now, what is so unique about that? Well, what is unique about McDonald's going into India? We know that McDonald's sells what? Primarily hamburgers. It is a fast food giant. 
and their main central item on the menu is the Big Mac. And in general, it's hamburgers. So they also sell other types of sandwiches, but the Big Mac is the sandwich that you can find at any location around the world. But what's unique about India is India, in India, slaughtering a cow is against the law. And because they're predominantly Hindu, Hindus do not consume beef. And so then there becomes this issue of how do you adapt the menu to suit the Indian uh, consumer behavior. And here you have an article on that talking about the uh, vegetarian lifestyle of many of the citizens there. And here you have the menu, different adaptations, paneer salsa wrap, paneer is cheese. They have the filet of fish and they have a lot of other different variations to the McDonald's menu. And of course, McDonald's and a lot of fast food companies, when you go abroad, you'll notice that they're more family oriented as opposed to the United States where you're just going to pick up something and go to the drive, drive through or go and pick something up, take it home and, and uh, have it there or eat it in the restaurant. But here you have entire families engaging in this um, experience. So these are some of the different cases. There are literally hundreds, thousands of these cases. Uh, because let's be honest, as we at the, the half hour mark, there is more business overseas than it is at home for the simple fact that we have 7.8 billion people on the planet and only 330 million in the United States. So obviously there are more people abroad than there are here domestically. So that is what makes it so attractive when these companies seek to, to, to go abroad. Now this value chain is comprised of activities and um, I posted behind me, you see this example of the value chain it is comprised of marketing, production design, or R&D, manufacturing, and logistics. Logistics is how do you get the product from point A to point B? Supply chain management, how do you optimize the entire supply chain from procurement, getting your supplies, getting your ingredients, designing, manufacturing, marketing, logistics, customer service, is the entire supply chain. As a company, you have to offer a value proposition. What is a value proposition? A value proposition is a promise. A company is making a promise that they will offer you certain types of benefits if you buy their product. That, that benefit could be convenience. It can be based on price. It can be based on durability. It can be based on customization. It can be based on a number of things that you may find important. So that value proposition is stating that if you buy my product, you will get this benefit from buying my product. You will get the utility from this product. And that is what a value proposition is. And so it says that a company creates value for customers by improving benefits or reducing price or some of the other things that I have just mentioned. So they have this formula of what determines value. Benefits divided by price. So obviously, if your price is lower, price being in the, in the denominator, then your value increases, right? If your benefits increase more than your price, then your val value also increases because that equation gets bigger, okay? So value is benefits divided by price. Now, many companies decide that they want to compete in this market and they understand that there are parameters 
Of course, you all remember the economics, supply and demand, right? And you remember the axes, the y-axis and the x-axis. So what what are what uh, are the elements on the y and the x-axis? You have price and you have quantity, right? And so with your price, that will determine or that will impact the demand. You have an equilibrium. Remember that? You have demand equals supply, and that's the, the equilibrium right in, in the, the center point. So when demand equals supply, everybody's happy. The seller is selling at the price that they want to sell. The buyer is buying the product at the price they want to buy. That's the equilibrium. Anything above or below the equilibrium means that there is friction in the market. There are inefficiencies, and there may be a surplus, or there may be a shortage. Now, if you're a company and you're able to you're able to sell at an equilibrium price but you're able to provide more value then you have a competitive advantage because you're offering more value for the customer if you're able to give them more benefits as as a relation to price or if you're able to give them a lower price as it relates to benefits then you have what is said to be a competitive advantage Another quote, Jay Barney, create it when a firm has value creating strategy not simultaneously being implemented by any current or potential competitors. So you have to find um, your specialty. You have to find what you're good at. You have to find niche markets. Uh, a niche market is a market that is not currently being served. And if you're a smaller company, Sometimes you can fill a, a very specific niche and um, gain your uh, presence in that, in that market. Globalization is a lot of things, uh, means a lot of things, and it has a lot of different ways that people look at it. Globalization is a process. It is an action. And it is also something that people use to describe a stage that you have a certain level of globalization. In When you talk about going abroad, you have globalization of markets, globalization of production. Globalization of markets are like those articles that I just showed you dealing with consumer products looking for markets overseas and trying to understand how the four p's need to be adapted we know the four p's right we have product you may have to change your product you may have to change your price you may have to change the way you promote it and you may have to change the way you distribute it we notice in the nestle article that i showed you you had the woman pushing the buggy so that was a different method of distribution because those who may be in the city, um, perhaps it would be uh, it wouldn't be cost effective or be cost prohibitive to actually have uh, trucks coming in and out. And so you have uh, this person or maybe persons who actually distribute these products using these carts. And so that was an example of distribution or place being adapted to suit that particular market. Many different aspects of global industries. As I mentioned, you have global marketing, which means you look at the expanse of the globe as a market. If you have inter, international means between or at least two. Multi means what? Means several. It can be three or more. Typically, when you say multi, you mean multiple or you mean three or more. When you say inter, inter means at least two. And global means that. It's all encompassing of you know, all of the countries. And, and so the levels of globalization depend on 
the ratio of cross-border investment to total capital investment. The more cross-border or international investment, the more you have vested in the global market and the more you can consider yourself to be a global company. A few ideas here in strategic focus. You have a lot of purchases uh, of companies. So much so that sometimes you don't know who owns what. You don't know what company own, is owned by, by what parent company or what country is that product or that company uh, native to. There are lots of different cases. In fact, there are a couple of articles and um, I, I just pulled up an article that shows you that you have a lot of American companies that, or even companies that we think are American but are actually foreign owned because they were, uh, a majority stake was, uh, was purchased by a foreign, foreign entity. So then they affect become a foreign company. And we're talking about companies like uh, Budweiser and Church's Chicken and um, Ben and & Jerry's. And many of these companies are now foreign owned. And if you talk about um, Firestone and, and you're saying to yourself, these are American companies. And it just so happened that Burger King was even once foreign owned is now back into American ownership, but it had changed hands a couple of different times. It was owned by a Brazilian company. It was owned by a British company. And now it is owned by a conglomerate. Uh, and I believe if I'm not mistaken, they are headquartered in Miami, or at least the controlling share is uh, from investors in, in Miami. Pros and cons of globalization as we wind down. You have a lot of pros. And in my global business class, I talk about this in greater detail. The first chapter in global business is called globalization. And globalization is, again, an, an, uh, it's a platform. It's an idea that countries are more interconnected or more interdependent. And because of the independence, you have a, a supply chain where countries specialize in certain activities. And when you specialize, that means that what your country does best and what they have the resources to do, they will specialize in that and then they will export the benefits to the other countries. All the other countries have specialties as well they export what they're good at, everybody benefits, right? So in globalization, you have this, this increased efficiency and you have an increased um, array of products and services that you have available, that, that are available to you. And so that's supposedly better for everyone is that you have more options. Now, with more activity, you have more employment, more jobs, and then obviously more jobs, people are earning incomes, and then they spend more. So you have this cycle of prosperity being built. Uh, you have, uh, obviously, companies are happy that citizens of, of that country have more money to spend. So you have some, some benefits. You have specialization. You have an increase in the number of choices. You have the creation of jobs uh, and you have a more robust uh, global economy. Now, there's some side effects to that. And there have actually been protests, not like the one we had when, last Wednesday, but in some instances, it, the, the issue was just as, as uh, critical because you had these people protesting saying that globalization is contributing to poverty of developing nations because the richer nations exploit the poorer nations for their cheap labor, 
cheap resources and the fact that these smaller nations don't have leverage. And so it says here, not all gains from globalization have been evenly distributed. We see now they mentioned Trump. So we have a new addition. They, they were able to get Trump um, in the, these examples. America First Agenda is an example of nations retreating to protectionism and isolation, which means that now instead of all of these agreements and all of these relationships, you're saying, okay, we're going to pull back and we're going to manufacture at home. Even though we have higher wages, that would be good for Americans, right? You have more jobs coming in. And of course, labor is relatively expensive here. And so companies would then have to make some adjustment in their prices so that they can recoup their cost. Okay, so you're correcting one problem and you're creating others as well. And, and that's essentially what is happening here. So you have globalization in reverse, or you have a retrenchment, companies like Apple, manufacturing in China decides that they want to retrench and they want to bring more jobs from China back to the United States. So it's globalization in reverse. Standardization versus adaptation. The idea that you standardize means that you're taking a product that you have in your product line and you're going to export it as is no changes or very few changes, um, which you may say that is a good thing because I don't have to spend extra money repackaging it, coming up with a new promotion, coming up with a new package, and coming up with uh, essentially uh, what would be uh, increased expenses. And, you know, having to come up with a new ad campaign, it's uh, okay. It's it can be very costly to do that, to have uh, to adapt the product that you've already created. So standardization is keeping everything the way it is. You have both your products and your promotion. So you can standardize both your product and promotion. That's one thing you can do. For adaptation, you can adapt both your product and promotion. What are the other options? You can standardize your product or keep it the same and adapt your promotion, or you can adapt your product and standardize your promotion. So you have four options and you have a last option, which is to make a brand new product not a product that you adapt or standardize, but a brand new product for that market. So you have some great options. You have options in terms of what number of countries you want to target. Single country marketing strategy, you have the four Ps. If you're talking global, now you also have to look at the four Ps, but you have to look at the factors. You have to look at the political environment, the economic environment, the social environment, technological, competitive. You have to look at the uh, geography, the lay of the land, the terrain, the humidity, the climate. You have to look at a number of different factors when you go abroad because it's different. Now you get into comparative, this, this cross-cultural marketing, which is very different. Then they get into some of the markets. You may have heard of the BRICS nations here. Uh, the Mints, which is a relatively new construct, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey. These are very large countries. Mexico has one of the most um, populous cities. Indonesia has the largest population of Muslims um, in the world, believe it or not. Nigeria is the largest um, country, a most populous country on the African continent with about 200 million people. Uh, Turkey is a very strategically important country 
which is between the Middle East and Europe. And so it has access to the, uh, a very large market. And I, I believe uh, it has been trying for a number of years to become part of the European Union. I believe there are 28 countries as part of that uh, union. And Turkey is a very influential uh, member um, or aspiring, like aspiring country to become a member of the European Union. Okay, as I wind down a, a few more slides, this idea of global localization, there is a concept you might hear called glocalization or being global, global and local at the same time, which means that you have a global mindset, but you have to consider the local environment. All of the things that I mentioned before, what I call in global business, uncontrollable factors, political, legal, economic, financial, social, cultural, technological, competitive environment, geographic, uh, all of these are factors that you have to consider when you localize uh, into a foreign entity, into a foreign country. Uh, and it says here, maybe a combination of standard and non-standard approaches where you have the way you distribute, like I mentioned in the Nestle case of with the buggies or packaging where you may package something slightly different. You may know that uh, if you use mayonnaise, that when you go in the refrigerator, you grab it and it's in a jar, right? It's in a glass jar and it's recognizable. You go to Latin America, that mayonnaise is in a plastic bag uh, with a spout on the top. That's the way it is packaged there. So it's slightly uh, different. And, you know, have a picture behind me of mayonnaise in Latin America. McDonald's in France have muted colors and golden arches are more subtle. American franchisees saw the success in France and implemented similar renovations. And also in France, they have a McDonald's that's almost like a restaurant. You go in, there's silverware, and it has the ambiance of being like a restaurant. And um, also an interesting case in Israel, where because they have Orthodox Jews who cannot mix meat and dairy products, they have decided to distinguish kosher restaurants from non-kosher restaurants that those Israelis who might be moderate Jews or um, those who may not practice, they want their cheeseburger. But Orthodox Jews don't want to take that chance. So McDonald's has allowed the franchise to create a different color scheme for kosher restaurants, which is blue and white. Still the golden arches, but the blue and white will signify that this is a kosher restaurant. There you have some of the, the different um, mark, the, the marketing mix of uh, McDonald's. And also, if we look at the expanse of marketing activities around the globe, as I st stated before, there are 330 million people here in this country. So that means that most of the business is going to be outside of the country. And you can see the numbers here. Look at the different orientations as we close into the hour mark. That ethnocentric is the standardized approach that I talked about. Very little changes. You're just extending that product over. Polycentric, you're looking at many a multinational approach where you're looking at each country differently and you're adapting products to suit each of those markets. You have regiocentric orientation. You're looking at different regions which may have similarities. And so you're able to get uh, similar types of strategies for regions. Um, let's say, for example, if you're in Latin America or if you're in a particular region where the language is similar and some of the cultural, uh, some of the cultural traditions are similar, 
then you may be able to take a regiocentric approach. And then you have geocentric approach, which is a combination of strategies, both standardized and adaptation elements, which is essentially what Coca-Cola does. Coca-Cola is pretty much the same everywhere you go in the world. They make some slight changes to the packaging. Some countries mandate that Coca-Cola has to have it, the, the, the uh, Coca-Cola um, lettering in their language. And so you have slight differences. If you have a chance, make sure you visit the Coke Museum in Atlanta, Georgia, because they have, uh, you know, they have the tour and they talk about the founding. But at the very end, they have a place where you can sample all of the different Coca-Cola drinks from around the world. And they have all these fountains and you can just go and, and try as, as much as you like. And it's just very interesting to taste, um, you know, the different drinks that countries um, are, are having around the world. So there are a lot of trends. And as you know, we have a very critical situation here with the uh, new administration coming in and with the unrest that we have seen over the last week. Um, it remains to be seen what is going to happen when, when President Biden comes in and all the different relations, uh, the treaties that were abandoned by President Trump, uh, it's going to change a lot of the, um, it's going to change the, the direction of how the global economy is going from now. And hopefully that will be a good thing uh, because there, were, there was a lot of damage that was done in terms of this country's standing on the uh, world stage. The U.S. foreign policy is likely to see a dramatic shift for Joe Biden in the driver's seat. Biden, as the president of the United States of America, will also have a bearing on the global economy. Our next report is going to be on the global implications of Biden's victory. Here's a look. What would Joe Biden as president mean for the world? While Biden may have to pursue some policies of Donald Trump, like the ongoing Cold War with China, Given the disastrous effect of coronavirus pandemic on the U.S., change is likely in many other areas. Among the countries closely watching the elections is Russia. A democratic administration is expected to impose new economic sanctions on Moscow. This president embraces all the thugs in the world. I mean, he's best friends with the leader of North Korea, sent on love letters. He, he doesn't take on Putin in any way. And uh, he, uh, he has just, uh, he's, he's learned the art of the steel from the art of the deal by Xi and China. Across the Atlantic, European leaders are hoping relations will improve under the Biden presidency after the bitterness of the Trump years. Remember these mass protests on the streets of London when Trump visited the UK in June 2019? While Trump has often denigrated other European leaders over new trade deals in a post-Brexit world to Paris Accord, the expectations are huge from Biden. He's pulled out of almost every international organization. He gets laughed at when he goes to the, uh, li literally, not figuratively, when he goes to the United Nations. I mean, it's just not, it's not about the president per se, it's about the nation and the lack of respect that's shown to us. The Biden camp has signaled that if he wins, his administration would attempt to renegotiate the nuclear deal with Iran that was scrapped by Trump. It is something Riyadh and Abu Dhabi would be closely watching as well. Under the Biden administration, relations between Washington and Ankara, which have hit rock bottom under Trump, could also see a new beginning. Bureau Report, India Today. So that is going to do it. We're at the one hour mark exactly. And hopefully you've had a chance to get through the entire video. 
Uh, I am going to uh, lead you to the quiz. This is a 10 item quiz. It won't take you that long to prepare it um, or to prepare the answers and, and, and it's multiple choice and you just go through. And I uh, just want to see where you are in terms of your marketing knowledge and um, it would also give me an idea of whether you watch this video. So make sure you um, complete the quiz and I will see you on Thursday and we'll discuss best frozen foods and hopefully that will get us going for the spring semester. Okay, be safe and I will be sending more updates, class updates, um, but I will see you on Thursday. Take care.